Hello and welcome to the Far Away Nearby. This is a show about two nerds and intellectuals sharing laughs about life and experience along the way. I'm your host, DJ Star Sage, and I am joined tonight by the Duchess Sue. How are you, Sue? I'm fine. And yourself? I'm doing well, thank you. So, um, we're going to go right into the highlights of our weeks, our peaks and valleys. Go ahead and tell us, how was your week, Sue? Well, it was not too bad. My husband was taking his mother to grave sites, and while well, they were out in the country, because there's some graves, there, there's some graves in, at, at a small town uh, just south of us, and while well, they were out in the country, somebody ran a stop sign and ran into the front of the car. Uh, after we have had it appraised, we have to, in order to get the car paid off, we have to total, I mean, they're totaling a car. Mm-hmm. And so we have to get us a different car. Oh, and no. And it's kind of annoying because we have to go out and look for one and, you know, all of this stuff that you have to do when you replace a car. Yeah. Did everyone come out of the accident and okay? So, oh, yeah. No one was hurt. Okay. Uh, except the cars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it wasn't fault, so... So that's okay, mm-hmm. but uh, and no, and no one was hurt. It just then they were able to drive away. Uh, they didn't have to get the cars towed. So uh, those things were all pretty cool. But uh, it also was just kind of annoying. And since we are considering moving, it's inconvenient for us to have to look for a car in the middle of this. Mm-hmm. So is the car still drivable? Or yeah, it, it seems to be still drivable. Okay. But in order to get the sufficient money to pay off the current loan on it, mm-hmm. we have to let the insurance company take the car. Oh. So so that's how they totaled it, and then they'll give us some sufficient money to pay off the, the car. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that means we have to get a different car. The whole insurance process can be somewhat confusing if you've never run into it before, because <laughs> I know, I think, it, well, it's been a couple of years now, but Billy got into an accident with his car when returning home from a late night doing inventory Mm -hmm. and he was only going maybe 30 miles per hour on this street it had been snowing but he ended up hitting a telephone pole Mm -hmm. and you know to somebody who has no experience with car accidents well i'm not entirely um ignorant of the situation i i I did hit a tree with my first car and Uh um, (laughs) I, i i didn't know that it was pretty much kaput until they tried to put it up on the rack and saw the engine block was cracked hey but anyway I, I didn't know that totaling just simply meant the insurance company considered a loss. You know, you can, yeah. if you own that vehicle, you can still technically drive it, but you have to get it to pass inspection. Well, yeah, it, 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 um, yeah. And I think that if we wanted to, we could go ahead and drive this car. Mm-hmm. But the issue was the, the loan at the bank. So it sort of became what the bank wanted. Right. Uh, and since we were, oh, and apparently, And apparently we wouldn't be able to get full coverage from this insurance company again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was not from any insurance company. I don't I don't know. Yeah, I think it has something Uh, to do with liability versus collision. mm -hmm. But anyways, that's another show. So so they're (laughs) they're taking the car and we have to find a different one and we have like just a few days to do that. Oh boy! So that we, I mean, we can uh, borrow a car from uh, our daughter and her mm-hmm. family for a few days, but not for very long because they need all their vehicles pretty much. So, what, what was the best thing that happened in your week? The best thing that happened. My physical therapy is still going well. That's good. Uh, but the arm is healing very slowly now. My right arm and my left arm have different kinds of replacements. So they they they. Oh, they foreign and domestic. <laughs> Yeah, so and when I had the right arm done, I think I could use it much easier and and I could pick things up. I can carry things with my left arm because hanging down it will it will accept weight, but if I try and if I try and reach over and pick up something like a cup of coffee or something, it, it's just it, it's not there. It's not doing it. It's going, no, we aren't going to do that. So it's the horizontal type lifts that that is the problem and they tell me that this is normal, but it just seems wrong to me. I've been busy with family obligations. This is the high and low point of my week for a change. I may (laughs) still talk a little bit about work, but um, 
I had a cousin's wedding that I attended the other week, yeah. and last weekend I went to my great nephew's birthday party, and that was mm-hmm. both of those were adventures. My cousin's wedding. That was an experience because my cousin has expensive taste, just like my eldest sister, sister Ronnie. She did her wedding on a budget, but she did well for that budget. Everything yeah. was very tasteful. She did a few things that I hadn't seen done in weddings, but you know, I I have I don't exactly spend my days going through bridal magazines. But um, well, why not? <laughs> right, you know. Um, <laughs> could be a side career but uh the uh the reception area was gorgeous because uh well she had it at a country club oh. and she had these beautiful little topiary trees that flower sitting as her centerpieces oh. yeah. and um she did this thing where she had like a, a mantle clock or just clocks sitting on all the tables and they were set to the time that the wedding vows took place yeah so it was like a moment in time and <laughs> That that was very um, you know thoughtful and it's really think, romantic. I mm-hmm. just I like that. Yeah, and um, I was very impressed because um, it was you know a, a very nice blend of informal and formal. All of the um, the dresses, including the brides, was were this floral print, um, yeah. a very kind of English cottage look, and um, <laughs> the the most sentimental part of the service, at least I felt, uh, was in the actual um, hall that the vows were in. They had little potted plants along the aisle as you walk down, yeah. and my cousin is of the age where she might be too young to remember her grandmother because she passed away some 10, 15 years ago now. Yeah. And and this young lady is only in her, you know, early to mid twenties. So, okay, but yeah. it was very touching because the potted plants that were along the aisle were flowers that her grandmother planted in her garden. Oh, well, that's kind of cool. And it was, it was very touching. My, my aunt, her, her mother um, didn't expect that. And, yeah. you know, it brought a tear to her eye. Um, mm-hmm. But my cousin, she's a daddy's girl. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it was very evident during the ceremony because while her parents are divorced, her father had a part in the service he actually uh, sang a song during the reception and one of the uh, centerpieces was labeled for him to take home yeah however her mother my aunt um, wasn't even asked to make a toast at the reception oh, wow so I thought that that was a little bit more than rude but at least my aunt had a good time in that um, when it came time for people to get out on the dance floor she yes. went out and enjoyed her Self and it was um, it was very reassuring that things were okay because uh, I saw the same spirit in my aunt out there on the dance floor that I saw a few years before with a great uncle who was in his nineties and he was dancing with twenty somethings. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the other thing that I did the other the uh, the weekend after that was um, I I went to a family picnic. And uh, Billy was actually able to go with me for the first time in a while because his uh, his normal schedule with his work only allows him to have one weekend off a month. Yeah. And so we were um, we were figuring out that he hadn't been to my sister Ronnie's since uh, a year ago Thanksgiving. Wow. So. <laughs> She was really excited because they like to trade decorating tips and she gets secretly oh. <laughs> jealous of things we're able to do with our house because it's old and people won't resent if we paint here because it's not the family home. Right. And um, anyway. And also, you own it. It's not a rental. So that's. Right. And um, so she was excited that we were going to come down and uh, we were supposed to go straight to the picnic site. It was in on this um, scenic overlook park where they do like glider plane launches oh wow <laughs> and uh, they have a little kitty park there with amusement rides and whatnot yeah. but it's uh it's not near my sister's house in fact it's between my sisters and um we 
she said for us to meet her at the picnic site that my niece was going to be there first because it was her son's birthday and right. we were supposed to be there 435 ish well um ronnie said that her husband wasn't getting out of work until four o'clock and i thought to myself oh well that's interesting how are they going to be there 435 ish <laughs> um and it's not that close to them so yeah. you know i aired on caution and we were there there about five my niece was already there but i i tell you no lie when i say that it was no surprise that my sister did not show up until almost seven o'clock wow <laughs> yeah we're very fortunate that we're in the time of year that we are because it was still broad daylight but um we were also very lucky that our stepdad was among us our 80 something year old stepdad was the only reason that any of us got to eat that night because the um, said brother-in-law had come home from work after four o'clock and had shortly thereafter decided to take an hour nap. Oh. And, um, you know, that's one of those things that she ends up blaming him whenever they're late for things. Well, in her situation, it's hard to tell because she's locked away in her suite. You know, the, oh. <laughs> the, the, the master bath is off of their bedroom, back in the corner of the house. And mm -hmm. she's a therapist, so she'll receive on-call calls at home. Right. So you never know if she gets interrupted mid-shower and has to answer a crisis. But, yeah. um, you know, it's just we've come to accept that <laughs> whenever Ronnie says she's going to be somewhere, you always add an hour. And yes. it's funny because she says the same thing of our other sister. Well, you know, turnab turnabout is fair play with sisters. Mm-hmm. So, yes, um, thank goodness for our stepdad, because we would not have eaten if it had not been for him. Um, Did he bring food? No, he manned the, he, he, he uh, operated the grill, and uh, my brother-in-law was really in no mood to, um, to function. Yeah. And, you know, they, we had charcoal out and lighter fluid, and he was trying to get a fire started, and stepdad was just saying, you know, this is the sort of thing that could take an hour normally this is why you're supposed to show up on time because you know if you're going to yes. eat it takes effort and uh -huh. of course they didn't bring foil with them my <laughs> sister goes down to the gift shop by the amusement park hoping that they had foil they normally would but they ran out luckily for us we had been sent to the store before going and we had picked up some of those baking pans that are foil yes and, you know, they don't come one or two to a pack. You get, like, five or six or whatever. Yeah. So I told them, I said, these are foil. Just set them on the grill, and you can cook anything in them. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And and if you want the real grilling experience, I suppose you could slice them between the, the grill things and, and bend them around like you would a tin foil. Mm -hmm. But um, you're right. If you just set them on the grill, they cook, and you don't need to worry about that. Right. So so I guess the saving grace of that barbecue was that our stepdad was there and we brought foil pans. <laughs> well, that, that, that's good. And you, so you got to, you actually got to eat. Yes. That's, and that's always a good thing. After the picnic with the nephew, which actually it was kind of priceless, my other nephew, who was about 14, my, my brother's only child that was present. So Jughead's child was there. Okay. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> He uh, he had balloons that he was supposed to be in charge of. He was decorating the pavilion. Yeah. Billy asked um, Jughead's kid if he wanted help with the balloons, and he figured he'd got it. He wound them up on this thumbtack that was smushed in on the end of the picnic table, and he figured that was secure enough. The, uh, the afternoon, or shall I say <laughs> evening, progressed. We suddenly remembered there were balloons, and we thought, Oh, where did they get to? Because I don't see them anywhere. And they and were Billy, all <laughs> Well, it's worse. Billy chanced to look upward, and they were up in the trees. Oh. <laughs> they had actually gotten loose from the picnic table outside of the pavilion. Oh, okay, yeah. Had gotten up in the trees, and we had all forgotten about them. And Billy takes a look over at Jughead's kid, and he's like, <laughs> what happened to the balloons? Yeah. And Jughead's kid looks upward and he's like, oh no. He goes, don't say a word to anyone. <laughs>
the uh, the evening ended up with uh, after the picnic, we went to a drive-in movie, and well, that sounds uh, fun. It had been a number of years since I'd been to one, and Ronnie had told me that that was the plan was we were going to go to the movies afterward, uh-huh. and. Um, it's kind of fun because Billy and I, you know, we 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 still have very um, childlike uh, entertainment values. <laughs> so it's you know, it's sometimes it's nice just to turn on a cartoon and veg out and yeah. forget the <laughs> the cold hard world. But uh, it was the the latest installment of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, oh, and then yeah. uh, Angry Birds. And oh, yes, I saw that Thursday. It was mm-hmm. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, I was proud that I managed to make my way through it without falling asleep, but, <laughs> but, uh, I was very glad that we each had our own separate cars because, um, Ronnie had her husband who was already asleep in her car and well, you know, basically <laughs> continuing his nap and, um, the 14 year old who lost the balloons, yeah. um, and then the car between us was my niece and her total of three children. Um, okay, yeah. And so she has a uh, an infant. She's got a three-year-old and mm-hmm. a the birthday boy who's like seven or eight. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it's like, let's play Big Fort in Mommy's truck. And, you know, which one of you is going to be good and go to sleep? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think any of them were asleep, and I'm not sure she got to watch much of the movies. But, um, but uh, yeah, we 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 had the hindsight to actually uh, pick up a little portable radio. Yeah. Because uh, I got an older car, and we just thought to ourselves, you know, if we run the radio off the battery for two movies, we're probably not going to be able to start my car. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect night, but anyways, that w- that was uh, what I've been up to lately. So uh, here we move on to our topics of the week. Uh, did you have something interesting you'd like to talk no. about this week, Sue? Actually, I there were a few things that I I have thought about that are sort of interesting. Uh, I just before the show noticed that Oprah is getting married. Oh, is she making an honest man out of uh, what's his name? Deadman somebody. I, I don't I don't remember his name. I just I just saw a picture on Facebook and I apparently have gone past that picture so I don't know what happened to her. But uh, yeah, she apparently is getting married. Oh. They had a picture of her crying on her show and she announced it. Uh, and Ella and Ellen DeGeneres has been fired from her show. Really? For for breach according to the rating or the, the article I saw on it. A mm-hmm. breach of of uh, for breach of contract with her sponsors. Now she has found this wonderful makeup stuff or cleanser stuff that has made her look young. Of course, um, a few years back there was a uh, TV show on USA that uh, it uh, focused on the sensationalism of wanting to look beautiful, and it was all about plastic surgery. It was called mm-hmm. Nip Talk, and yeah. um, there there was um, a storyline in there where these ladies had discovered this um, this remarkable beauty secret of how to make your skin look younger. And let's just say that um, the secret ingredient of their breakthrough product had somewhat pornographic origins. <laughs> 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 well, you know the people. I, somewhere I read that that new tech or or heard this. This was uh, maybe it was when I worked for the computer science and engineering department at the university. But because uh, they were always coming up with strange ideas, somewhere I read that that new technology of any kind seems to show up first in the porn industry. Uh-huh. So that when when they started streaming on on computers, mm-hmm. the live streaming on computers, that was researched and and started being used by the porn industry and then other people started it and and many things like that start with the porn industry if what what you want done is they they're going to find a way to do it because it's interesting and it's exciting and and it makes them more money so um for my topic this week 
I uh, stumbled across this article on a site that I like to visit with sort of strange and unusual obscure news. It's called FARC, F-A-R-K, like kite. Mm -hmm. And um, this week I discovered an article that was in the British tabloid, The Mirror. Um, The article is titled, British Warships Breaking Down in the Gulf Because They Cannot Withstand the Hot Sea. Oh, wow. (laughs) And so just a minor overview here. Um, so basically, as you might imagine, just as with the U.S., we've got major companies that will do, you know, the different systems on a, uh, a naval vessel. And in this particular case, the company that happened to be doing the engines for some of the Royal Navy ships is Rolls-Royce. And, <laughs> um, it's interesting because as I read into this article, they're talking about, um, they design 8,000 ton ships and claim they are not told they'd be spending long time, periods of time in hot water in the Persian Gulf off the coast of the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and uh, it says okay. four of the ships are currently at sea with one outside of Europe and others in the UK territory. And it basically says each ship is fitted with two Rolls Royce turbines, which help keep the vessel on the move by transferring heat from exhaust into the engine. And the turbines work best in cold water, meaning the balmy (laughs) seams of the Persian Gulf cause the turbines to malfunction as the engine is deprived of power. So, um, Wow. How old were these vehicles, the ships? um, I don't believe it details that, but, you know, it's just one of those... uh, oopsies you know you they overlook it's like you know we yeah. didn't ever mean for this to be in <laughs> this part of the world and if somebody well, had told me and yeah and, just like england has never ever worked in the middle east they mm-hmm. never they 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 never had a war over the suez canal they they never were the were the protectorate and and sort of owners of Afghanistan, Palestine. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about Saudi Arabia, but Jordan. Uh, and I think maybe even Syria. I, I, I can't name all of them because I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, it's not like England ever did that. I, I, and, it's not, <laughs> and it's not so far away that Rolls-Royce might forget. I mean, it's within their lifetime. Mm-hmm. I think that it. I think that England started that kind of relationship with some of those countries before Rolls Royce was formed as a company. Right. Unless they were building carriages at one time, and I don't believe they were. Well, I guess uh, maybe maybe this might be akin to <laughs> oh, we didn't know these these boats were going to be going to the south, so you know, we, we didn't we didn't we didn't fit them with air conditioning. Yeah, I just that that just. That just strikes me as preposterous. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, when when managers get around to building things, I mean, it's not necessarily the engineers who get to make decisions about stuff. Right. And and they may have looked at something that the engineers thought, you know, there there could have been an engineer there going, well, let's see, the, the Navy has spent some time, you know, in, in hot water as well as the colder waters. So maybe we shouldn't design this so it can work in both places and then they send the uh what they need to do that to the to the top brass and they're going oh this is way too expensive they have to make it for one or the other yeah Uh, it seems like this whole story is just a a pr cover-up of oh we didn't want to spend the money so now we're going to say Earlier in the week, I put out a message that we were going to be recording a show, and we asked some of our listeners to provide us with questions. So Mm -hmm. if you are ready, we'll go ahead and enter into our question and answer session. Okay, and uh, many of these questions are courtesy of our favorite podcaster, Toppy Smelly of the Smellcast. Oh, (laughs) okay. So I thought maybe if you would like to start off with the first question. Okay, just a second here. I have okay. misplaced my slash way I've set all these things on top of it because I am still, I am an old person 
and I am still used to things on paper. Mm -hmm. So I printed this out. (laughs) Okay. So the first question we have is, talk about your hometown. Where were you born? And if you aren't living there now, would you ever consider going back home to live? Well, so you want to start out with this? Sure, and then um, you can answer the question as well. Okay. So for me, um, well, my hometown is a little place in what we I like to call Western New York. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, most of the quote-unquote civilized world understands that there's a New York City, and they understand that there's an upstate New York, which basically <laughs> applies to anything outside of New York City. But those of us from the actual state will tell you that there's a large part that we like to call Western New York because, well, we're not in New York City and we're not in Albany. So, (laughs) And you aren't aren't that close to the East Coast. No, well, I'm not coastal. I'm closer to the border of Canada at home. Oh, cool. uh, (laughs) I, I like to say that I grew up in the part of New York that has cows. Ah. I actually grew up across, with a cow pasture across the street from my high school, and um, I had all of 92 people in my high school graduating class, and that's only the result of, because we had two school districts that merged, so it would be even fewer if that weren't the case. Yeah. Um, but my little sleepy town that I'm from is... Somewhat conservative, as you might imagine, out in the country there. And um, I was actually born oh, probably about 40 minutes to an hour from there. It is a college town where I was born, but I, I didn't actually grow up there. Um, my mom got a job opportunity to, that took the family westward from there. So I didn't grow up where I was born. But in mm-hmm. hindsight, I don't think that I could live in my hometown, although the little town I'm living in has um, many things in common with that small town. I think the biggest difference is that I'm basically a stone's throw from my job in the bigger city, um, yeah. whereas there, it's it's quite a bit further a drive before you get to a larger population area. Yeah. So you're not going to have a pride parade. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> you're you're more likely to have a Memorial Day or Labor Day parade and be a member of the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution than you would to have a pride parade in my hometown. Yeah. I lived in a town between, well, halfway between the two largest towns in the state, and and it was it was larger than the town I grew up in, but it certainly was kind of conservative. And I like to annoy. I lived across the street from a Methodist church, and I like to annoy them by by playing Jesus Christ Superstar every morning while they were having church as loud as I could stand at the house. I just, I don't know why, but it just, I was born in Lyons, Colorado, which is a little, well, it used to be a little town. When I was living there, there was all of 800 people in this in the city or in the town. And it was basically a drive through to get to Estes or, or up in the mountains. It was just, and it was a lovely little town. And I really liked it. And I, if it were still like the little town I grew up in, I would be interested in moving there. However, there are these people that live lived in Boulder and Denver and other places that decided they wanted to live there too. And there were enough of the natives that were giving up their housing. So they started building houses. And some of the natives decided that since there were people looking for housing, they build housing on their lots. And so the house next door to, to where I grew up or where I'm, and I, I, I have to change this as to growing up because I was only there until I was in sixth grade. And I spent some summers there after that. But I, it, we moved out and we moved for various reasons after that. But uh, it, it was indeed the favorite place I have ever lived. But that town no longer exists because there are like four houses in the lot that right next to where I live. There is a big structure in the back of the lot or, or, or in the, behind the house where I live. It is the size of a two-car garage, I think. And the... The house and this 
and this building are owned by a glass maker, a glass blower. And apparently the town has gotten very artistic and there's a lot of artists that live there. But and he you know, he, he uses that big large building as as his shop and he builds things back there large glass sculptures and stuff which is kind of interesting but on the other hand it's kind of not so cool mm-hmm. <laughs> so your your hometown has changed a lot so it, it, you, it's you, changed so much that i wouldn't want to live there but mm-hmm. i still could go to like allen's park or maybe estes park estes is a big town but it, or a big city. I, I don't know its population, but it's still, it's up in the mountains. Uh, and and no matter how many houses they build up there, you can't get rid of all the trees and you can't get rid of how beautiful it is. Okay. And the same with Allen's Park, which is which is smaller. Mm-hmm. It, it's quite a small city and frequently gets snowed in. So that would be kind of cool to live in. Okay. <laughs> so our next question comes from Toppy Smelly, and he asked, uh, he asked me, uh, how do you? What do you like about living in the Flower City area? And uh, well, I just want to preface that I actually don't live in Flower City. I actually live between my husband's job and mine. We, mm-hmm. when we were house hunting, we basically knew that, of course, we each work in different cities, so yeah. we wanted to find a place that was relatively in the middle, and. I think we got the best of both worlds where we are because um, we both have a similar drive and we have this nice sort of suburb-ish setting. Mm -hmm. We're kind of rural where we are because um, we're not actually in a suburb. We're like a town over from a suburb, but it's it's close (laughs) enough that it feels the same to me. Yeah. And, um, you know, of course, the nice thing is, is that we are outside of the village here. So we have a lawn. You know, we're not so close to our neighbor that we have to share a driveway. Ah, yeah. And uh, we have our own mailbox. It's not one of those setups where you have a cluster of mailboxes for the, mm-hmm. you know, the street. Yeah. Um, we don't we don't even have sidewalks or street lights here. So when it's night, it's very calm and dark and peaceful here. <laughs> yeah. We, we don't have any businesses nearby. You know, you, you, you probably have to drive, well, it's only five minutes into the village. So if you need mm-hmm. to be at the gas station or whatever, but you know, we, we don't have a bar next door or um, any sort of a, a business that would uh, have traffic here. So it's, it's a nice mm-hmm. quiet area. In an alternate reality, one in which any possible fears or failure were non-issues. What would you be doing with your life that you once truly wanted to do, but never had the courage or possibly, possibly the means to do? In other words, if you could be doing your dream job right now, what would that be? That is quite a question, and, and uh, just the wording tells me that that's toppies also. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't say where it's from, so. So. Um, yeah, I just. <laughs> well, since I answered the last question, and it was for me, go, go ahead and tell us about what your dream job would be. Well, when I was young, I wanted to be a playwright, but that depends on talent, And you have to be able to write plays that people want to see. And to the best of my knowledge, all of the plays I wrote never really became things that anybody was interested in producing. And I'm not sure that if, of course, in the alternate world, I would be really talented, then I could write plays and possibly movies and, and, you know, be J.J. Abrams. But uh, that's, uh, that's doubtable. And I guess... I haven't had the most successful of lives, but I have not had an uninteresting life. And I've never really hurt anybody too badly. I've never hurt anybody physically. I never, you know, like accidentally killed anybody in a traffic accident. Uh, I have been helpful to a great many people. And I think I've had a fairly satisfactory life. So I don't know that I would change things a lot. Well, for me... Um, it's, it's interesting that you say that you, you think that, um, your dream job would be a playwright. 
when I was a younger person and I was finishing high school, everybody was on that track of, you know, what are you going to do with your life? <laughs> right. <laughs> and having been uh, the youngest in my family and growing up with people who are all older than me, I always felt like I stood out from the group I was in. Mm -hmm. So I, for that reason, I got along with those older than me better than my own classmates or my own peers. Yeah. So while they were thinking ahead and imagining what they were going to do with life, I was just wondering when they were going to catch up to me. <laughs> um, but in all fairness to them, I was held back a year. So they had that against them. And I was born in January. So I was almost oh. two years older than a lot of my classmates. But I thought for a time that I wanted to be a journalist because I liked to write. And okay. then I got into college. And in my first semester, I did all right in my journalism class. I, I think that I probably got a B. But I realized that writing about the truth wasn't anywhere near <laughs> as fun as making it all up. And yeah. you really couldn't offer your own opinion on matters of the world unless you had gotten to that coveted position of editor. Yeah. So, um, so I, th if I had my dream job, I think that I would be doing movies. I think that similar to, your dream job of, of doing plays that I would be making my stories come to life for others. Yeah. And, um, we, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing, the time that we live in because, you know, you, you don't any longer have to be a professional in order for you to get um, exposure or for you to get discovered. Even, you know, we, we have things like YouTube now that you're, are month, some months into producing a podcast. What have you learned? How have you been enjoying it? And what's been the best part about it? And what's been the most disappointing? Well, um, what I've learned is that I always am not as prepared as I ought to be. Uh, I I think of myself as being a, a really good ex, extemporaneous speaker, but I don't. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I am. Uh, quite, and I am having memory issues now in my life, and and so I need to prepare better. I need to put more things in writing or on the screen so I can actually refer to them because I forget people's names and and places, and I get kind of um, distracted. But uh, the other thing, uh, the the disappointments we've had some issues with having people decide they want to work with this and then decide that, well, that's way too much work. Uh, and I don't think that that's necessarily, uh, I, I don't think that, that the amount of work was actually, was actually, um, I don't think the amount of work is actually a secret because you do have to prepare for these things. You can't, you know, our, our agenda, uh, how we produce the podcast, what, what was true was not, uh, or what we were going to do was not a secret. And so you needed to have some preparation for it, just like if you were performing in a play or you're reading news for, uh, you know, you work for the ABC News or the NPR or something. It's, you can't just come in cold. And, uh, and if you make a commitment to be there, you need to be able to be there. You can't say, well, you know, I've got something else to do. I want to mm -hmm. do something else now. I enjoy it because it's interesting. I, the the idea of putting out ideas to to a world <laughs> is kind of nice. I mean, it rubs the ego a little bit, massages that, makes you feel kind of good. Okay. I get to tell other people something about my life, something about what I see about the world. Uh, I tend to look at books and articles and things that I think people ought to read interest in politics and books and so i tend to focus on those things a bit how have i been enjoying it um i'm enjoying it immensely because i'm i made the best decision when i decided to invite my longest friend to uh participate in these chats with me because it's just like we're sitting down with a pot of tea and we just happen to be recording mm -hmm. now um 
you know, what the uh, the man behind the curtain will tell you is that what our listeners get to hear and what we actually banter on about, <laughs> that could be a whole nother pot of tea. But well, uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> and um, that's the, the best part about it is that I get to work with a good friend. I think the most disappointing part is when you unfortunately learn that people you uh, are looking forward to collaborating with may not necessarily have the, the level of enthusiasm or maybe their availability is much more limited than you'd hoped. So mm-hmm. you end up making other plans. Um, it, it's kind of like uh, having a crush and you're working up the courage to ask that person out. And then you realize they're not interested. So now <laughs> you have to approach the next opportunity with the same enthusiasm, but not let on that they're runner up. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I can see that. <laughs> the next question, please re-describe for your listeners how you all know each other and maybe go into it with more detail than in previous introductions. Well, um, I met you in a training class for a company that we both were starting to work for many years ago. And in some ways you, we were probably the most um, different kind of people. We just didn't kind of fit in as, Mm -hmm. as much. Although I think you did a better job than I did. I just, the only thing that I think really thrilled me, people that I worked with is that I had a little Palm Pilot. It was a little, it was about the size of a phone or, or, a, uh, or an iPod touch. It had games on it. There was a calendar on it. You could use it as a, for reminders. There were a lot of little programs on it. You couldn't put new things on it, I don't believe. I tended to kill time with playing games and sometimes reading stuff on it. Uh, it didn't have the, it didn't have the access to books that, that, uh, our new things, our, our new devices have, but it and that kind of interested people. That it was something. It was this little electronic thing that I held in my hand, and I and it had came with a little stylus thing, and, and I would be punching things and doing things, and it was a it was a secret thing. It was a very personal thing. It wasn't you know, and I think that interested the class. But other than that, we met um, learning how to to tell people how their internet worked and, and you were most odd and that's how I make most of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we, as Sue said, <laughs> we, uh, we met in a training class at a company we worked at together and I've since learned that we both seem to have met during um, new chapters in our lives from what I recall, Sue had mentioned that she was moving back to her home state and she had just recently given notice at her um, her long-term job because she ended up getting a, a, a supervisor that um, didn't play nice with others. <laughs> and um, I, I was in denial because I was in a relationship which should have ended years before, but um, I didn't have the support of a good friend for me to realize that I deserved better. And that's part of what I gained through my (laughs) friendship with Sue was that she was there during those awkward moments and um, helped me to gain the courage to realize that I deserve better. Please name a favorite book, a favorite stage play or musical, a favorite movie, and finally a favorite TV series. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go first on that one? Go ahead. Okay. Well, I would say that a favorite book of mine is um, by comedian actress Rhett Butler, or, sorry, Brett Butler. And uh, she had a sitcom of her own for a while, I want to say back in the 90s, called Grace Under Fire. Yeah. And I've had the privilege of seeing her uh, perform stand-up in person. This book was an autobiography of hers, and in it, it mentioned some of the obstacles she's encountered in life. Um, so, uh, her first marriage, and uh, coming to terms with the fact that she was an alcoholic, and 
also being estranged from her father. Um, in fact, I believe at one point she mentioned her father was no longer in the picture and she hadn't seen him in years. And then she learned that um, he was still with us and uh, she actually met him in her young adult years for the first time in a long time. And uh, why that's one of my favorite books is because she shares some of the strengths and weaknesses that have gotten her through life. And she found out that although the man who was her father was somebody that she'd been estranged with, uh, by or to or with or whatever, uh, and somebody that she had grown to despise because he had left them. But uh, after meeting him as a young adult, she learned that she had had much more in common with him than she wanted to imagine. In fact, um, some of his favorite authors and favorite books ended up being hers. And when he finally passed on, she mentions that she ended up keeping some of his favorite books because he had underlined favorite passages and whatnot. So that's one of my favorite books is it's called knee deep in paradise. And it's a fantastic read because it's by a woman of strong character. And if you find yourself in a tough spot in life, you know, material like that really helps you to appreciate what you have that might be better than others. Favorite stage play or musical might be a little harder to come by because I haven't been exposed to much theater. I will say that of the uh, theater that I have been exposed to, and this may sound a little um, tacky, but compared to classic theater, I, I'm not sure I have a reference to compare to. The only experience I have with, well, one of few experiences that I have with live theater was in high school, I was able to go to Toronto and we saw the production of Phantom of the Opera. You know, while certainly Andrew Lloyd Webber can uh, be critiqued on whether or not that's, that's pop culture or if it's actual musical theater, um, I found the experience wonderful because, of course, you know, somebody who's not familiar with the story may not realize that there are parts of the story that don't get incorporated always in the telling. Like um, the fact that the star of the show was an underdog. She actually, Christine, was a poor student who couldn't pay for her own classes. And in the original tale, which was a black and white film, or at least one an early, earlier telling of it, she had a secret admirer who paid for her classes. The secret admirer actually became the phantom through an accident in a photography darkroom. And of course, in the more modern uh, retellings of that story, that's not included. So I would say Phantom of the Opera was my favorite play. Favorite movie, I would say, would be What Dreams May Come, starring Robin Williams. Mm. I found that movie very powerful because it's visually stunning in many scenes. It I I um I came to learn of it during a very special time in my life. My father had recently passed away and I was only 22 at the time but I had managed to find myself completely on the opposite coast and thought myself to be an important person because I had transferred with my employer then and that happened but it um it was very powerful because of all the imagery I guess you call it illusions that it makes to how certain symbology has relevance in your life. Uh, it, it's a beautiful film for anyone who hasn't seen it because it deals with the afterlife and this notion that we are much more than just our bodies, that yeah. our, our being is a consciousness that continues to exist, possibly, whether or not your physical body is still there. Of course, Nowadays, it has uh, a much stronger meaning in that, of course, Robin Williams, uh, you know, it's, it's come to light that Robin Williams was one of many people who suffers from a mental, who suffered from a mental illness. Mm -hmm. One of the subjects that the movie What Dreams May Come 
covered was the topic of suicide. So, yeah. And then finally, of course, a favorite TV series. And this is something that anyone who knows me personally <laughs> would be no surprise at all. Of course, it's Star Trek. And if you're going to ask me which one, I will just tell you all of them. <laughs> of course, you know? it has to start with the original series. But in my mind... Even the the series is that some if some critics might call the worst installments, yeah. they all, they all had their good elements. They all all had their best stories. So I, I am a uh, a diehard Star Trek fan. Well, that would be one of the things I would agree with you. On. My favorite television movies or, or my favorite television show series would be the Star Trek series. I really like those. I liked all of them. I watched all of them. And every once in a while, I go back and watch them again. Although I am not such a big fan that I went out and bought copies of all of them. <laughs> and I, a favorite book, I am very, very fond of Jane, Jane Austen and Charles Dickens and William Shakespeare. And it would be hard for me to put any of those things right at the top. Um, I know they're old. And I... <laughs> And some of them have become popular recently and some not, but those are my three favorite writers. And I just, I, I don't know how to, how to put them. Although there have been a couple of recent things that have been based on Jane Austen that I really kind of like in terms of books. One of them is Death Comes to Pemberley that is written by a famous British sus- sus- um, suspense or, or uh, murder uh, series of books and there is another one that is about that that goes back and covers the story in terms of the people who work in the house the maids and the and the yard people and what have you i'm not i'm not i can't remember exactly what that is but uh, the name of that book but that those are both very interesting i did not read any of the uh of the jane austen and the the vampires or the zombies or any of that because I thought that that really it, it just didn't seem to be it seemed very uh, hokey I, I don't know I, I'm not I'm not sure what to say but but those those are my favorite writers and I couldn't tell you the a, a favorite book particularly I like all of the things they wrote I am sorry that I can't get a hold of all of Charles Dickens books the things that he wrote because not all of them have ever been in print in this contemporary time, and I haven't been able to find old copies of things. But, you know, we'll keep looking. And my favorite stage play, rather than being one of Shakespeare's things, would have to be A Royal Hunt of the Sun. Again, I didn't think to look this up, but and I can't remember the writer, but it was very popular with a certain sect in the 70s and 80s, and it is about the Spanish killing of the Inca Indians. My favorite movie, I really liked how the West was won. I saw it in in the way that it was supposed to be portrayed at Christmas time when I was a kid, and they showed it in, it was in, like, it took up half the theater, the screens did. It gave me a terrible headache, but it was a wonderful movie. It was just, I, and I, I think anything I would have seen that in that, in that Cinerama or something, I don't know exactly what it was called, but, and that was the only movie I ever saw in that. And who are the main actors in that? Oh, the West was one. I don't, it had everybody. Jimmy Stewart was in it. I don't think that, I think Peter Vonda was in it. I don't think John Wayne was, but he might have been. Because all the parts were a little small. Uh-huh. I mean, even the major parts were a little small, and some of the people, but and there were there were very famous people in it. And I can't remember, but Jimmy Stewart and Peter Fonda were in it, and I have always loved them. Hmm. They're very good. There there were a lot of other people in it I, and, and that were really famous actors, and hmm. I can't remember all of them. I was, and I have seen bits and pieces of it on like television or, but I it's not it's not the same movie if you can't see it in that in that cinerama and that's the way i remember it even when i even when i see it on parts of it on television i remember the movie as it was with the you know just surrounding you almost search back in your memories mm-hmm. as far back as you can possibly recall what do you perceive as your earliest memory 
And I love his example. He's given us an example. For example, I remember being alone, laying in my crib as a two-year-old, hugging my stuffed tiger as a thunderstorm was going on outside. I distinctly remember telling my stuffed tiger that everything would be okay. (laughs) The earliest memory that I have, and um, I, I consider myself very lucky for this, because um, I, I'm very fortunate in that I had a stay-at-home dad, and that's one of my earliest memories as a child, was before I was school, I was old enough to go to school, I would take afternoon naps with my dad. We would have lunch before my siblings came home from school. We would watch PBS, and we would watch Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers. And I just remember curling up with my dad on the couch and sleeping behind him when we would take naps. So that's my my closest and fondest memory and earliest. Well, yeah, I that that is that is also a really exciting memory. However, uh, when when my earliest memory is kind of odd and and a, a bit like our our fan here for our listener. Uh, my earliest memory I, I have is breastfeeding. And someone walked, I have no idea how old I was, and I have no idea how long my mother breastfed us kids. But And someone came to the, we were in her bedroom, I think, and someone came to the door of the bedroom and said something to her. And I looked around, and I think it was my brother. Uh, I had a sister in or two sisters and one brother, and and that's it. And then it goes away, and that's the uh, that's a memory. But it's a kind of odd memory, and it's something that I guess I cherish. It's I I can't remember anything. The next thing I remember, I was like three or four years old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, there's there are stories about me when I was like two years old that I have no idea. Out in the far away. And that's all the time we have for this episode. We hope you'll join us next time when we bring the far away nearby. So thank you for listening to the far away nearby. You can visit our webpage at thefnpodcast.com. Find our fan page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TFNDJ. And visit our companion blog on Tumblr. Our show is available on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Send us an email at tfnpodcast at gmail.com or call and leave a message at 720-230-6919. This show is part of the Pride 48 Network. Find more shows over at pride48.com.